the edicts of the crown. By the way, this crown is not the queen or the king. That's the sovereign. The crown is a club that meets in a separate sovereign nation. That nation is called London. London is a small little town with only a population of 2,000 people. London is made up of 13 different cities. The, uh, the actual city of London is from the uh, Tower down to the Strand. And in there, very few homes or no apartment buildings. What's there is the Fleet Street, controller of all communications in the, uh, in the British Empire. The Temple Bar, the control of all the law offices. All right. The World Masonic Headquarters. <laughs> Victoria Station, the Bank of England. Now, when the Queen goes to London, not when she's just drawn into the shop, but when she officially comes to London, she goes to her sovereign and bows before her sovereign. And that sovereign stands there with his staff and his chain and his medallion of his Masonic uh, thing. He is called the Lord Mayor. And she bows to the monarch of this separate sovereign realm called London, which is not subject to British law, not subject to the Parliament, and not subject to the Queen. She is a foreigner when she enters London. The capital of England is not London. You go across the street and down around the corner, and that's where the capital is. But look in the sign. It doesn't say London. It says Westminster. The capital of London is Westminster. Now, the capital of England is Westminster. Excuse me. The, the, the capital of England is Westminster, not London. There are no government offices in London. Okay? The Queen is not coronated in London. She's coronated in Westminster. At Westminster Abbey, across the street from the Parliament. And down the garden is out back. You go down the garden and there's Buckingham Palace. That's in Westminster, which is part of England. London is not. It's like the Vatican, which is a sovereign nation. And it's like the Villa de Malta in Rome, which is also a sovereign nation. The Maltese Masonic headquarters is a separate sovereign nation. Three acres, in, I've been there, in there, in Rome. All the Catholic nations send diplomatic representatives to this sovereign nation called Ma the Maltese Order, Masonic Knighthood. All right? And masonry has all sorts of stories of Hiram, of beef, and so forth. If you ask them, is it really historically true? Well, no, we made it up. But it has within it the message of truth, you see, is what it is. Oh, Cyrus sure is a made-up story. No Greek is going to stand on the Iliad and the Odyssey as an actual fact. All right. They are supposed to be stories teaching religious truths. This is why Masonry says all the religions are really the same religion. They all are except one. The only name in the Masonic Lodge you're not allowed to pray in is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray in the name of Buddha. You can pray in the name of Hindu or Muhammad. That doesn't make any difference. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not permitted. For what do we have in Acts 4.11? For this is the stone which is set at night of ye masons, which has become the head of the corner. For there is none other name given among the heaven whereby ye must be saved. And that's repeated four times in the Bible. Over and over we have that same expression. There is none other name. Well, anyway, <clears throat> what is Horus really? Horus is not a person. Horus is an idea. The Horai are all of those who look for the returning of the golden age of an absolute dictator, of an all-wise, powerful king who is able to allocate and bless us all with his wonderful wisdom and direction that we will submit ourselves to in a coming millennium of a thousand years. Horus are those priesthoods, are those believers, are those initiates all who look forward to the returning of this perfect world utopia. One world, Egyptian rule, Babylonian rule, Jewish rule, name what it is. The same thing. It's the same story, told in different variations, but never changes. 
in its essence. Every Masonic temple is laid out with the entrance in the west and the altar in the east. And in the east is the sunburst over the worshipful master who's up seven steps, a man addressed as worshipful. Can you imagine worshiping a man that's condemned? What if Peter wouldn't take it? I'm a man as thou art on your feet. <laughs> I'm a man as like thou art. A sinner in need of grace. Peter was no different than, than, than that centurion, the Roman soldier, right? Peter was no better. He refused worship. Now, watch what happens. Every Masonic lodge. And by the way, Judaism is straight Masonry. Or Masonry is straight Judaism. Take a pick. I don't care. Do whatever way you want. The altar has got to be going to Southern Baptist Church. See how they move them around and get the parking lot in the back end and the entrance the other way in order to get that altar in the east and the entrance in the west. Now, a Mason will ask you, if he doesn't know whether you're Mason, have you been to the east? Have you been east? That means have you been initiated in the lodge? Because you are always moving from the west to the east in search of light. Can you imagine all these preachers like Bob Jones and these great fundamental Christian preachers who are also Masons? They came. Bob Jones started preaching at the age of 13, but he can't be initiated in the lodge until he's 21. Therefore, he had to be preaching eight years before he came to the entrance of the lodge. And at the lodge, he has to say, Or I, who am in ignorance and darkness, come unto the, the, the lodge in the search of light. Here he is, supposed to be a Christian, a preacher of the gospel, and he is in ignorance and darkness coming into the lodge in search of light. Isn't that something? Can you ask me whether a child of God could do that? Who knew anything in Scripture? I could see one who didn't know anything about it all. He just thought he's come out for a beer bust. You know, I, I, I can't pass judgment on the individual. I can on, on what is said and what is done. But notice he moves from the west, which is the setting sun, the senior warden, to the south, which is the noonday sun, the junior warden, to the worshipful master who is in the east, who is God with them. The third person of the Godhead, the sun and the moon and the worshipful master. Baal, Stardy, and him. That's the guy. Sitting on his throne with his hat on. Men's head would be uncovered. Woman's head would be covered. They got it the other way around, of course, because everything is opposite. Now, I said, now, let me ask you, because when you're talking to a Jew, you're talking to a Mason. He knows what you're talking about. Bane Brith is a lodge. <laughs> all right? Now, I said, now, I'm going to ask you a question. Of course, I hadn't t said all this, but I'm telling you now. I just could put that aside. I said, now, in the Garden of Eden, where, it's, where was the entrance, in the east or in the west? Pardon? In the east. They went out east of the Garden. And God put two seraphim, the guard, the entrance, only two. Why didn't he put them all the way around? Because there was only one entrance. <laughs> right? To keep them from returning into the garden. They went east, away from God. Now, watch something else. When Abraham came into the land that God would show him, he came, and this is when I, I, I discovered this one day. I was reading this little passage, and I couldn't figure out why. Abraham came into the land that God would show him. He didn't even know he was there. And he built himself an altar to offer sacrifice unto God between Ai on the east and Bethel on the west. Now, why did God spend time carefully to tell us that Ai is in the east and Bethel is in the west? Unless there was some reason. I mean, we don't have to go over and locate because we don't know why Bethel is or Ai now, so how can we locate the altar anyway, all right? So the purpose must be in the text itself. What does the word Bethel mean? In the Hebrew, every word has a meaning. Bethel is the house of God. What is Ai? The refuse dump. The garbage pit, if you want. Or there's another word for it. Hades. <laughs> right? Got it? Anyway. Here he built that altar. Now, if he wanted to go to Bethel, which way did he have to go? He had to go west. And the entrance was in the east. But if he goes to Hades, he goes east, and the entrance is in the west. Which way is the Masonic Lodge laid out? Now I said, let's go here. When God had the children of Israel build the temple or the tabernacle in the wilderness, 
He very carefully lined out the directions in every pin and every socket and every drape and every part of that temple, didn't he? Or that tabernacle. And the entrance is in the west and the altar in the east. When the priest went in to make his sacrifice on that day of atonement and moved from one uh, uh, sacrament to the other, he always proceeded west, 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 west. And when he went for the atonement of the sins through that veil, he went before the altar, not without blood, but without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And then he went behind that altar, barefoot, all the way west, and shook the blood on his footsteps. A man fallen and had walked away from God out of that garden to cover his sins and the sins of Israel with the blood. He went all the way west. When the temple was made in Jerusalem, that temple by Solomon, where was the entrance in the east or in the west? The entrance was in the east, the altar in the west. And the Masonic Lodge, which claims to be from Solomon, has reversed the whole thing. Now, watch when the Magi went to seek the Christ child when he was born. Which way did they go? East or west? They went west. They came from the east, heading west. There's only one way you go to God, and that is to go from the east to the west. When you go from the west to the east, in, in Scripture, you're going away from God. What does the word repent mean? It means to turn about and go the other way. That's what the word means, change direction. You've been going east, head west. Have you been to the west? I always ask a mason, have you been west? Have you been to the west? <laughs> right? And these guys, all their eyes open up like big saucers. The whole bus, they'd all been east. Everyone on that bus had been to the east. <laughs> and I'm the only one that's been west. <laughs> I said, you see, we're going two different ways. You're going one, I'm going the other. You're going away from the tree of life. And to nod. I'm trying to come from nod to the tree of life. Isn't it interesting that every mason will say, Oh, masonry is based in the Bible. Yeah, you just take the Bible, reverse it 180 degrees, and you got masonry. The exact opposite. Why? Remember something about masonry. Everything about masonry is a lie. The first thing a mason is going to tell you, Oh, it's based in the Bible. I always tell them, Well, that's lie number one. Let's get to lie number two. You have a Bible sitting on that altar and you have the tools of masonry on top of it. But you don't need a Bible. You can put the Koran on there. It would make no difference. Masonry doesn't require a Bible. Any holy book will do. Why? They don't believe in any of them. What difference does it make? Hey, Watch what a mason. He joins there. They say, there is nothing in the lodge before you come in here that is going to interfere with your religious beliefs or your politics. There is nothing about masonry except politics and religion. It is totally a religious political movement. Nothing else. Everything in there is going to be religion. Everything you're going to get from then on. And now watch the next thing. they got all of these symbols and signs. And they'll tell you the meaning. Well, what is the meaning of that? Well, the meaning of that is this. But there are deeper meanings. In other words, we just lied to you the truth we didn't give you, but we gave you something to hold you off for now. Now, what a little later on you get along and you keep paying your money and coming back and you say, now what is the meaning? They give you another one. But there are deeper meanings. They lie to you again. You can go back and ask them 10,000 times. They give you 10,000 meanings and every time they tell you we lied to you because there's still yet deeper ones. What is the ultimate one? You don't know. You can go in that morass forever and you never know where you ever got to the end of it. You're never going to get an answer to anything. Why? There isn't any. There isn't any. It's a whole mambo-jambo without meaning. It is based on lie. Hi. You must never reveal and always conceal. Every bit of truth from your wife, 
You can never tell her the truth. You can never, can you imagine something that swears you to tell a lie to everybody and call it moral? Think of an organization, and we want to know the problems in this country. Think of an organization that requires its members to keep the crimes of a brother member as violent in their own breast as they are in his. In some lower degrees, murder and treason, you can reveal. But in the higher degrees, not even that. But that means rape, fraud, theft, I must conceal. If I know you've raped somebody and I conceal it, I'm guilty, both under the civil law and under God's law. But not under masonry, I'm noble and moral. Notice the complete reversal. Here is this judge. He is sworn to come to the aid of a brother mason, whether it be right or wrong. Yet he swore on the Bible when he took that oath of office that he would be impartial under the law. Which oath does he keep? No matter which one he keeps, he's an oath breaker. He's a liar and a fraud. There is no way for a mason to be an honest man because he is sworn to be dishonest in everything and every dealing except with a brother mason. Oh, but it has a moral code. Watch the moral code. I am not to have sexual relationships with another mason's wife of the same degree or higher than my own. That's a very moral thing, except this, unless she consents. If she consents, then there's moral. Hey, man, that just about opens up everything. That means that I can go out and rape anybody I want in the world as long as not another mason's wife unless I ask her. All right? And then if the Lord agreed, because that doesn't count anyway. That's a moral code. The Lord Jesus Christ, if thou lookest with a lust upon a woman, thou hast committed adultery. If thou lookest in the heart. And yet they say this is based on the Bible. I want to tell you nothing could be further from it. There is no way to even make these two things at all compatible. One is a total anathema to the other. This is why in a lodge you cannot pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I certainly wouldn't want anybody praying in my church in the name of Baal. Now, we are not all brothers. The Mason Swan say, we're all brothers. No, we're not. Brothers have the same father. Their father, which they claim, if you'll take their man, like Albert Pike says, they had only in the higher degrees are they to learn that the name of our God is Lucifer. Before that, they hide him in all sorts of names. Great architect, prime force, ancient one, or some other name to hang on it. Providence, all sorts of names. They'll hang on this God. They won't name him. Not anything that's going to be out in the public. But the name of that God is Lucifer. Now, those who are children of Lucifer are children of the devil. The Lord says, you are the child of the devil. Well, certainly, what is a brother? A brother is somebody who has the same father. I have four physical brothers. Why? We all got the same daddy. <laughs> That's what makes us brothers. There's lots of people I like in the world that are not my physical brother because they just didn't happen to be the child of my daddy. You see? A brother is one who has the same father. All right? Those whose father is the devil certainly are not those whose father is God. They are two different brotherhoods. Two different brotherhoods. All men are, are brothers? No, they are not brothers. You see, there's another lie. If we take masonry, every oath is a lie. Every step is a lie. And it's all in concealment and told to be lied to, by every, to everybody else in this world. Everything they require, this man, is immoral and dishonest, unscriptural and contrary to the civil law. And yet, who do we find in these noble organizations? But most of our top preachers, the bishops, the priests, the governors, the senators, the sheriffs, the justices of the peace, the judges, the presidents, the bankers, the corporate executives, the leaders of our community and of our organizations, right? And we wonder why, why the continual manipulation when there is a conspiracy, a conspiracy, and I didn't say there was a conspiracy, they said it, to come to the aid of one or the other, to keep a secret from all others, that I should go into court of law and not know that these other people they've already met in the, in the agreement, I have to go into court in a little while and I'm going to first thing I'm going to do. Is every one of the jurors, or is they being picked? I'm going to have them in one of the conditions on their, uh, they have to make out a notice given the, the basic statistics. Is how you are, uh, have you ever been a member of a secret order? If they have, I'm going to have them all dismissed. 
because they have already sworn to be dishonest jurors. Or certainly untrustworthy. Their character cannot be relied upon. And then when we get done with that, I'll have to ask the judge. If he's joined in any such oath, he has automatically ruled himself out as to being a judge. He cannot be a judge. He must, be, he must dismiss himself. Do you know how hard I'm going to be to find a judge to try the case? <laughs> I might exhaust the whole state of Michigan. We'll have to run through the federal courts. And it's going to get worse in the federal courts than it is in the state courts. That's 100% solid pact. Remember, you've got to have the rulers and the rulees, right? This is why liberty is lost, is because the liberty of a constitution requires on open and free access and impartiality in courts of law. That all parties, when brought before that court, that court is impartial and blind to who they are, but only to the facts at issue before the bench. That is not what you will see. I've been in cases where you've got the thing called one, and all of a sudden the other attorney goes, Oh, Lord, my God. And the judge reverses it. Well, let's go in and see what more uh, Albert Pice got to say. Well, I should tell you a little bit about old Albert. Now, Albert was a rather obese man. In fact, he was downright fat. And uh, Albert was a Confederate general, he was the only Confederate general to lose with superior numbers against the Yankees at the Battle of Pea Ridge. Uh, so it gave him one distinction. He uh, wrote, wrote some 1,600 volumes in his lifetime with a quill pen. He knew all the ancient languages, wrote in all the ancient languages fluently. Where he got his education and knowledge is a mystery. I believe he got it directly from his God, which he claims Lucifer. Uh, but either way, if you want to think he had this ability on his own, go ahead. Of course, most of the stuff in which he wrote the great volumes are direct copies of other people's work, as he just took pieces here, 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 and the other place. And you can just say he was one of the most prolific copiers of all time. But either way, Albert Pike designed 14 of the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite. He was the supreme sovereign commander of the 33rd, of which he was the first sovereign commander. And he is considered, in the Masonic circles of the Scottish Rite, the paragon, uh, uh, the top authority on the subject of masonry. If you read in Lady Queensborough, she has a lot more to say about him, all of which I can't verify, and I don't believe she could either. So, being that as it may, let's go to his own writings. It's a lot easier, you see, to take his own writings rather than what people say about him, because now you can pin him to the wall. There are 32 chapters in this book, you might figure out why, each one of which has a different title. The first one's called The Apprentice. All right, the next one's called The Fall of Craft, and the next one is called The Master. Why? The first degree is Entered Apprentice. The second degree is The Fall of Craft, and the third degree is The Master Mason. Each of the degrees are titled after the 33rd name of that degree. So here we are, chapter 1, paragraph 1. And let's just read what he has to say. Force unregulated or irregulated is not only wasted and void, like the gunpowder burned in the open air and steam unconfined by science, but striking in the dark, its blows meeting only the air, they recoil and bruise itself. It is destruction, not growth and progress. It is polyphemies blinded and striking at random and falling headlong among the rocks of it, sharp rocks by the impetus of his own blows. Sounds like reading Robert Welch, doesn't it? He wrote the same type of style, the same garbage. Of course, Robert Welch is 33rd degree. Remember the clock. <clears throat> but anyway, what? What is all that saying? All that words? Well, if we take out the words and come up with his saying, he's saying this that force, unrestrained or controlled or confined, is waste. All right? Premise one. Let's go to paragraph two. The blind force of the people is a force that must be economized and also managed as the blind force of steam. He's saying the same thing again, right? Repeating himself. Lifting the ponderous iron arms and turning the large wheel has made the bore of the rifle cannon in order to weave the most delicate lace. It must be regulated by intellect. 
this time. Yesterday we talked about assumptions. What is the assumption here? That the force of the people is blind. The blind force of the people must be regulated by intellect. The premise number, first paragraph is that force must be regulated and controlled or else it's waste. Paragraph two, that the people's force is blind, therefore the intelligent ones must control them. Here's the New Age magazine. This is the 33rd Degrees magazine, September 1950. I, for years, took subscription to this thing. My father was a Mason, and I kind of think they sent it to me thinking I was one. But uh, anyway, uh, I got for many years, probably, uh, uh, what happens is it's the same drivel once, month after another. You take it, you've seen one, you've seen them all. I can pick up any issues. And I say, this is the first one that I ever had, and so I'll just take out of this one. And if you, uh, well, I've got hundreds of them, and I can do this in any issue. I can prove what I'm going to prove to you in this one. So why waste time going through a hundred of them? Here's in the back cover. The Supreme Council favors the American public school, nonpartisan, nonsectarian, efficient, democratic for all the children of all the people. Doesn't that sound good? It sounds like apple pie and mama, doesn't it? All 100% American, until you read it carefully. Now, let's read it carefully. The Council favors, this is the Masons, the American public school. That is government school. The government is going to raise your children. You no, know, my daughter's 26. My son is 11. My daughter did go to a public school for two years, or government school. She was in the third grade some 20 years ago or so. She was having a little trouble in arithmetic. So I went down because I've had fairly good mathematical background and have a doctor's degree and so forth. I thought I was quite capable of teaching my eight-year-old arithmetic. You'd think maybe I could do it, you know. So I went to the school and I said, uh, say uh, to the teacher, I'd like if you would send home with Kim her arithmetic book and I could help her out in arithmetic and she could do better. We do not want the parent interfering with the education of the child. And I said, I said, oh, would you tell me that one again? I want to be sure I heard that. Uh, we don't want the parent interfering with the education of the child. I read, the school was in session in the middle of the day. I opened the door and I said, Kim, come out here. And she pops around. She says, you can't take her out of school. I said, ma'am, you get in front of me and I'll stomp right over you. I'll flatter you. That's my daughter and it's not yours. That doesn't belong to the state. You can't have her telling me that they wrong. That child belongs to her. No, over my dead body. I want to tell you the only thing is, you just tell them, no. You see, we go along. We wonder what's happening. We've gone along. We've gone along. We've gone along. We've got, they know you're going along. It's an easy route. You go along. And one day you wonder, how we got here? Do you know how the English Revolution started? A nobleman in the south of England, because the tax is one per cent per person, he said, I will not pay this percent, and he had his head cut off for a penny. And it brought the king down. It brought down the divine right of king, and it brought down, brought down the immunity of government from prosecution. That king was put in the trial, and he was executed for a penny. He realized that tea tax was only a penny per American. That brought on the American Revolution. Not a penny. You stand on the principle. What would happen if the Americans stood on the principles of that Constitution? Do you think we'd be where we are now? Everybody who said, oh, well, you know, what can we do about it? They're the ones that caused it. Not the conspirators in Washington. The people who did not stand up to them and say, no, I won't. What are you going to do about it? We're going to put you in jail. Okay, i got a lot of books to read, and I haven't got around to. So I spend some time in jail. Well, it's pretty rough in jail. So it's rough in jail. I've been in the Army. It's rough there, too. What are they going to do? Kill me? I'm going to die anyway. Put me in Iraq? Okay, let's go down to the rack. Go ahead. See what he's going to get you. He's going to get you nothing. The answer on the rack is, no, I won't. You know, they don't know what to do with you when you say, no, I won't. They all sit there. 
Well, we're, we're going to prosecute you. Fine. Go ahead. We'll put you in jail. Okay. The answer is no. No now. No next week. No next month. No forever. No is the answer. What reason? No, it's nothing at all. The answer is no. You don't have to be bright. No. That's the one thing the club can't stand. You won't play in their ball game. No. What threats have they got? If you're scared of them, now I'm going to tell you something. I've had threats in my life, and I've had attempts in my life. I've had some very attempts you wouldn't believe. And I want to tell you what's happened. They're the greatest times in my life. Do you know why? I've had these people, and I don't want to go into examples right now, but I know this. And sometimes I lose my faith in the matter, and I get scared like everybody else gets scared, you know? I mean, look, at I'm normal, I'm human like anybody else, the rest of you. And you sit and watch the powers of these guys, they got power. But I'll tell you something, and when I come to my senses, I sit and say, No, Lord, thou hast more power than they. Thy arm is not short. If I be in thy will, you'll sustain me. And if I'm not, all right, come what may. And I've seen the Lord take, in cases in which we had time to go and do it, and I don't care to do it right now, of a direct reversal of the facts so as, so unbelievable that there is no question of the direct intervention of God, holy hand, holding back, reversing. I've had a case where they're putting me in jail, and I'm sitting there, and these people have a whole conspiracy in the city government, and it, uh, even the city council chairman saying, don't touch that guy. Anybody who walks into court with him is through in this city. And you know what happened? I sit there and say, Lord, thou knows the way out of here. And here the head of the building department pulls my files, goes down the incinerator and shoves them in and throws a match to him and walks out and retires and goes to Phoenix and burned the ball. I don't know where he is, but that was on his heart. You see? But the Lord knew. I've seen this thing dozens of times. Now, every time of that, that's a, one of the greatest times that can happen to you. Who those things happen. They're wonderful. You've seen the direct hand of the Lord in your life. You know why most people have never seen the direct hand of the Lord? They've never stood. They have never seen the blessings. They'll never have the blessings because they've never taken a position. Now, you've got to step out there, boy, and I tell you, get out there sometimes on a thin limb. Until you get out in that limb, you're never going to see. You see, that's sustaining. Hey? Well, anyway, getting back here with public schools. We're not getting very fast in this one, are we? The American public school... Nonpartisan, non-sectarian. Well, let's take this one now. And sectarian. What does the word non-sectarian mean? Antichrist. There's only one religion in the world that is sectarian. The Christian faith in that Bible. All other religions are non-sectarian. Protestantism is non-sectarian. Catholicism is non-sectarian. Judaism is non-sectarian. Hinduism, Buddhism, all of these are not... What do you mean by sectarian? Sectarian, separate. It says you are to come out and have no part of the rest. That's what a sect, a sect is. One who set themselves apart and separated from. All the others say, let's all get together and let's find a common ground of understanding. We can all get together and agree on the truths that we all hold in common. We can get together in this nice council and have this nice mason represent us. The answer, the Christian answer is, no, I don't need it. You will go your way. I'm going to go my way. Now, the one thing they don't want, they favor non-sectarian, non-Christian, efficient, democratic, demos, mob, cratic rule. That if the majority wants to do something, that makes it right. Because the majority of the people in this world want to commit every sin. In fact, all of us do in our heart. We have the capacity of every sin. And that's what in our heart we want to do. Most of us don't do it for one or two reasons. We're either afraid of God or we're afraid of being exposed and losing our reputation. But the fact of the matter is, 
that all people who want to go out and get drunk doesn't mean drunk is moral. If the majority of the people want it lawful for us to go out and to uh, commit incest or rape does not make it moral or lawful in God's eyes. Our government was formed to prevent, the Constitution was written to prevent democracy. You will not find it in the Constitution or Declaration of Independence. It was the very form of government they were trying to prevent. This country was to be a constitutional republic. What do we mean by a constitutional republic? A government under law to protect the individual from the majority, from the mob, to protect that single black man from all the white men, to protect that single citizen from everybody, except by due process of law. This concept today of democracy, that if the majority wants to do it, it's okay, is an anathema to the Constitution and to the Word of God. A total reverse of the thinking of a decade, a century ago in this country. Democrat. For all of the children, compulsory, forced upon you by us, who are, are your superior rulers are going to force you to send your kids to our brain laundry to learn our religion and not to uh, and to learn all about evolution to learn about every error that we want to teach them. They are not yours. They belong to us. Now that looked innocuous, but look what happens when we take it apart. Here's an article, the same magazine. Written by, uh, this is God's Plan in America, written by another 32nd degree Mason, uh, Mr. Smith of New Orleans. He goes through this article, and he's talking about all of the religious wars and what God's plan is for America. Let's take a look at just part of it. And by the way, we can take any paragraph and get about the same thing. I just picked this one because it's just a little worse than the rest of them. King George of England is a Masonic light to his Anglo-Saxon people. By the way, what they're teaching is Anglo-Saxon superiority that they are the chosen race. This is a Masonic doctrine. Just as Providence, notice it's a capital P in this Providence, so we're talking about a deity, aren't we? Obviously, it's a God. This is a person, has chosen because it did choose. Therefore, we're talking about a person, a willing person, who is a deity with a capital out front, okay? Has chosen the Jewish race the children of Israel to bring the world righteousness by carrying the Ten Commandments. Wait a minute. Let's stop here. Is that right? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? No, we're only jumping. Let's just get out of that one right now. What's about it? Did the Ten Commandments bring the world righteousness? It condemned the world. Paul said he was condemned by the law. The law brought condemnation. Why? No one has kept it. If we broke it in any part, we've broken it all. Is there anybody who hasn't? Which one here is not guilty of every single sin in the Old Testament? Under the law. There isn't one. The Ten Commandments didn't bring anybody righteousness. Regardless who it was that was carrying it. All right? I'll get to the fundamental doctrine. Which emphasize, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Is that the emphasis of the Ten Commandments? What is the emphasis of the Ten Commandments? Quote it. You shall have no other gods before me. What did the Mason teach? That all gods are the same God. By any other name, it's the same thing. Right? God has his name above every name. All right? <clears throat> so also providence, uh, providence, this whoever this God is, they don't want to tell us the name of They're trying to hide it, see. Has chosen the Nordic race to unfold the new age of the world. The Novus Ordo Seclorium. You can find that in the back of your dollar bill, too. Right? Do new order of society. Their new order, Einreich, Einfurt, Einger. What was the name of the Third Reich's movement? The New Order. Then we had the New Frontier and the New Great Society. Adolf Hitler called his the New Order. That's what they call theirs, the New Order. Turn the page. Doesn't get any better. 
As stated before, God's plan in America is a non-sectarian plan. Wait a minute. Since the God of the Bible demands sectarianism, then who is this God here who's got God's plan for America? That obviously cannot be the God of the Bible. We must be talking about somebody else. You see the point? Because whoever this God is, his plan is non-sectarian. All right? Our Constitution is non-sectarian. Well, they'd like to say that one. Our great American public schools. Did you realize that there are great American public schools? God's chosen schools. Did God choose the great American public schools? I would like to see that in my Bible. What, are the, uh, what is the God command? Who's to teach the children? The Father is to raise those children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And what are they to be taught? To fear God and to eschew evil. Wait a minute. You see how everything gets twisted? Every last jot and tittle? Here we have that these great American schools are God's chosen. Well, if they aren't God's chosen school, I know one thing. I know who their God is. Their chosen schools are non-sectarian. The great spirit behind this great nation is, is non-sectarian. All right, let's go to the next verse. Our great American public schools have never taken away from any child the freedom of will, the freedom of spirit, or the freedom of mind. This is our great American public schools tell these little children to be their natural selves and develop themselves. To go down here and play and just do whatever comes to your little old heart. And you just come and we're just going to let you evolve along. You know what they become? They become their natural selves, which is brats. Ignorant, evil brats. Look, I want to tell you, if any of you are parents, you know one thing. You didn't have to teach your child to sin. That child learned how by the crying and turning on the whimpers to get you to hop to a hoop before he could ever talk. He did it by the first day. He started figuring you out and figured how to get around you and how to disobey you, and they couldn't even crawl. You never had to teach a child to lie, to cheat, to steal, to commit any sin. You had a whip goodness into him while a lot of understanding laid in the proper place of application. That is the divine reason the great God, our King, again another name, he won't tell us the name, right? Has chosen the great American public schools to pave the way of the new race, the new religion, and the new civilization that is taking place in America. What are they saying? The purpose of these great American public schools is to bring in a new race, a new religion, and a new civilization. Have you seen that happening? That is the purpose. And where is the engine of drugs? The engine of immorality, of adultery, of right now, one out of every ten teenage females will become pregnant this year. One out of three will be pregnant before she is married or turns the age of 20. That's the result of the great American public school system. That's the destruction of the family. The basic political unit. And why was this done? They took your money by force and forced you to send your kids to this thing. Those teachers aren't answerable to you. You don't count. You only bred them. Watch it. Any mother, father, or guardian who is responsible for taking away the freedom of mind, freedom of will, or freedom of spirit is the lowest criminal on the earth. Not a rapist, not a murderer, not a, a oath breaker, not a conspirator, but a mother, father who teach their morals and their religion and faith to those children, that's the lowest criminal in the world, according to that article, right? You talk about evil? You talk about gross, unlimited sin? Take a look at that. This is the 33rd official magazine of the New Age. Because they take away from that child the God-given right to become part of God's great plan for America, the dawn of the New Age of the world. The upward reach of mankind. Let's take a look. Here is the cathedral at, uh, is it Cologne, isn't it? Cologne, yeah. Uh, take a look at that building. All the statuary, all of the spires, the buttresses. Fabulous. I walked through, uh, down the roof of Salisbury Cathedral up there, the solid lead roof, massive thing going on. You take a look at that building. Unbelievable. Built in the 
11th century, 10th century. Unbelievable architecture. You can see the builders of that considering themselves to be kind of elite and superior to the rest. They also, because they traveled from one area to the other, were not part of the nation or land in which they were in. They were transitory. And therefore they combined together in a club or guild to set up a nation outside of a physical nation. Just like Israel. Then the, the Jews had bound together to form a nation, a conspiratorial nation, that did not need land for the last one and a half millenniums. A nation without a geographical location. The same with the guilds and the Masonic guilds. And, you know, those are quite a, you know, little buildings. Let's go down to the Lodge Hall. And this guy, this guy comes into the Lodge. The apron, by the way, is to cover up God in this world. And it's exposed in certain places before the altar, <clears throat> as you expose the divine part. That's why a female cannot be a mason. She doesn't have the right ingredients. The fellow comes in with a blindfold on called a hoodwink. He's hoodwinked coming in, and he'll stay hoodwinked as long as he's there. He has a rope around his neck called a cable toe. This cold toe binds him. And when he swears to the oath, he's now bound to the oath by that cable toe. They take the rope off because now he has an invisible rope. And when he takes a second rope, uh, uh, oath, there'll be two ropes around his neck. And the third, three. He is now treble bound. And he's bound for life forever. Now it's an interesting thing. The Masons teach this, that once you're a Mason, you're always a Mason. The Lord Jesus Christ himself cannot get you out. Now I want to show you something. We have two people in the Bible who are Masons. Mo Paul and Moses. We have a very interesting little verse in Jude. And I think this is the reason why they, that council of Nicaea was trying to get Jude out of the Bible. Here's a verse totally out of context. It doesn't seem to fit. It sticks, it sticks out because it doesn't fit. You know, most of the verses fit into a context. But here's a verse that just, bam, hangs right in there, slap dab on the page. And you wonder, what does that fit into? What does it ask about it? Verse 7. And when Michael contested with Lucifer over the body of Moses, he dareth not bring forth Riley an accusation. Wait a minute. What happened here? When a mason becomes a mason, he wears that pure white apron. And that apron must be on him when he dies and is buried. And his fellow masons stand around that grave at the graveside ceremony with no one else allowed to look in because you're not to understand what's going on. And they claim that body in the name of him whose grave this sprig marked. That's Lucifer. They claim that body in the name of Lucifer. Now, I don't know what this means, to be quite frank with you. I can't explain it. But Lucifer, for some reason, wants that body. And they lay claim to it. And Lucifer laid claim to Moses' body. Why Moses? For Moses was brought up in all the wisdom of Egypt. Why was the wisdom of Egypt? He was brought up the wisdom religion in the mystery rites. He was initiated in that great temple, probably the great pyramid. He was brought up as the son of Pharaoh. Now, Lucifer was saying, I own that body. And Michael was saying, no, the Lord is saved, he is saved to the uttermost. Lucifer's claim does not have precedence, nor any lodge. I'm sitting there one time, the first time I had learned anything about masonry, I was just reading this little book here, this little book, Captain William Morgan's. First thing I ever saw, and I was just reading that, actually I was giving a series of talks every hour and off an hour, and I was sitting out there reading this thing, and finally I got to lunchtime, and there's a bunch of Baptist preachers. And I was sitting at this lunch table, and I said, Mahabon. That's the password of a master mason. One head snapped around and looked at me, and I said, ah, got one. I knew nothing about masonry outside. I read about half of that little book. And I got down there and I got that preacher off to the side and I said, this is a big lunchroom. And we're standing over there, you know, I said, I said, look, Pastor, I want to know something. 
I want to know what this masonry is. I want to know. He looked at me just like this, and he clenched his fists, and he said, It's right up to the hell! And I can't get out! I said, What? They won't let me out? Once a mason, always a mason. You can't get out, and Christ can't get me out. I said, You are making Lucifer sovereign and Christ subject? I hadn't come across the verse in Jude at that time. Which helps out now, I would have used it, you know. But I knew that wasn't right. The Lord's told him that, but that can't be true. Not with my Lord, that can't be true. He comes either shot or unshot. He comes in there in search of light. With the tools of masonry pressed to him, and he goes and does oaths. Notice again, you always have this holy book in this altar, but then on top of that is the tools of masonry, which are superior to any holy book. When he comes into this lodge, this is not quite right. He should have a hat on. Up seven steps, we'll find the worshipful master, always under the sunburst. That G iridescent means generative power at the time of impregnation. What I have here, the terrestrial world, surrounded by the serpent, and the celestial world. The world's, what's that? This is, again, first degree, third degree. The candidate is supposedly in a, an enactment, killed and buried and raised again in the newness of life by three ruffians, uh, Jebla, Jebelu, Jebelam. Now, the Jebla, Jebelu, Jebelam are takeoffs of the mystic word Jebelo, in which the Masons preach, pray, and they pray in the name of Jebelo, Jebelo, Jebelo. Now, I'll tell you what it means. J, Jehovah, Bel, Baal, O, Osiris. The two pillars supporting the true God, which is Baal, the keystone, is the two false gods, Jehovah and Osiris. Now, those three names are worked in in the three Eruffians, Jebla, Jeblu, Jeblem. The last letter changing, the A-U-M, the Am of the Hindus, the Am, 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 Am of the prayer of the Hindus. They got them all. Jehovah, Baal, Osiris, and Am. You know? They don't care. Stick anything in there. These people have absolutely no discernment and no respect of God. They raise him in the newness of life, in the old days in the pyramid. They wait three days and raise him. Nowadays they get him back up the same night by a lion's grip. They raise him in the newness of life in the name of Lucifer. And he is now born again. He's not born again till the third degree when he's raised in newness of life. This is his resurrection. Do you see what I mean by the false direct blasphemy? Every lodge hall, no matter how small, that sun first has got to be there. Here we are in Washington, D.C., a 33rd degree temple, 33 columns, 33 feet high, under a truncated pyramid. Always the Masonic Lodge must operate in the upper room. And it's going to be above the police station, above the fire department. It can't be in the basement. No, it's got to be in the highest place. It can be a one-story building, but it cannot be the basement. Go, let's go in. We're walking upstairs here. And this is the Tyler door. We are now in the west, in the entrance of going into the Great Hall and the 33rd degree. And there we are. We come in. Now, actually, you see, we're here looking back towards the west. And if we will look here, we'll see on the walls the serpents. You see the serpents? All the serpents all the way around the room. Read in Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8. God takes Ezekiel in a vision. That's during the Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel's in Babylon. And God takes him to Jerusalem. Whether he takes him physically or not, I do not know. Scripture doesn't say you can believe whatever way you want. It really doesn't make any difference. If he didn't say it, it's not important. But he takes Ezekiel and says he's going to show Ezekiel why he put Israel into captivity. And he takes him to the temple, to his holy temple, and he says, See what thou seest here. Look at the abomination. They have put the... Uh, the idol of, uh, of jealousy, the image of jealousy, a statue, in the gate of my temple. They set up a statue. 
God says, let's look further. Look here what thou seest. And he saw this hole in the wall. And he says, dig. Go in there. And he goes into the secret chamber under God's temple in Jerusalem. And here in this temple, they had the serpents on the 